Hello and welcome ladies and gentlemen. On today's special report, we look deeper into the war in Ukraine. Resistance is futile. And down the rabbit hole we go. Greek media organization Sky TV reached a new low by shamelessly reporting that this footage is panicked Ukrainians rushing to hide in bunkers. When in reality, this is a 2018 Rome Metro accident. Fox News reported on quote, armed Ukrainian citizens fighting off invading Russian soldiers, holding what appears to be cardboard assault rifles. You can't make this shit up. Fox News and the Daily Mail proceeded to report on an former Miss Ukraine resisting the invasion. They used a photo she posted on her Instagram page. This is actual footage of the heroic model slash actress taking cover from incoming gunfire and Russian shells. Call us conspiracy theorists dear viewers but it appears that she is posing rather than fighting. The trustworthy UK media announced the invasion in synchrony. Reporters on the ground interviewed a lovely, smiling lady, injured in the bombing of an eastern Ukraine city. Twitter users have since identified what appears to be the same unfortunate lady in a separate scene, where she has suffered different wounds and was bleeding from another part of her head. Totally plausible. A video emerged of a Russian tank supposedly running over a car. It was later fact-checked, and the longer version video clearly shows the tank had skidded and lost control, while it's uncertain whether it was a Russian or Ukrainian tank. More fake news has since emerged and got debunked. The truth behind sensational fake stories rarely goes as viral as the original story. This creates a bang-wagon effect, where the public sentiment about an event is shaped early on and is unlikely to change later. The verified Twitter account of the Ukrainian Defense Ministry joined in the fun of spreading misinformation. The ghost of Kiev ended up being footage from a flight simulation software. The always credible BBC reported that the soldiers defending Snake Island refused to surrender and were all killed. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has awarded each of the guards the posthumous title of Hero of Ukraine. It hasn't been confirmed whether the brave Ukrainians did indeed use foul language. But it has been confirmed that the 82 brave and hungry soldiers were captured and then fed by the Russian army. Reuters interviewed an advisor to the Ukrainian presidential office. He said, quote, The Chernobyl nuclear power plant has been captured by Russian forces. This is one of the most serious threats in Europe today. Perhaps he should have been asked about the opposition leader that has been under house arrest for quite some time now. In reality, having control of a half-demolished, highly unstable nuclear accident site is a huge liability and hardly an asset for an attacking army. The two armies have been jointly maintaining the site. A video emerged showing just that, but YouTube has since banned it in most Western countries. Let's have a look at how Western media was reporting the wars started by NATO and the United States. There was a certain excitement in the air when NATO was bombing Yugoslavia back in the 90s. The term collateral damage became popular during that time to describe the civilian casualties and destruction of infrastructure. During the NATO intervention in Syria, mainstream media went into great detail to calmly describe who is fighting who. There was no outrage and no one tweeted, I stand with Syria. In reality, the current war in Ukraine is the escalation of an existing conflict that started eight years ago. More on that later. Further back in 2003, 
the United States attacked Iraq to find the elusive weapons of mass destruction that were never found. The US media then insisted on getting other countries to support their war. The term freedom fries became popular in an attempt to cancel anything French as the French did not support the Iraq war. Again, there was no widespread I stand with Iraq movement. Ukraine and Kyiv specifically is considered by Russians to be the birthplace of their nation. It carries special historic not to mention geopolitical importance and therefore can't easily be left to fall under the influence of NATO and the United States. This would be kinda like if Pennsylvania Independence Hall, where the United States was formed, was located just outside the US border and Russia was trying to bring it under its political influence. At some point in early 2010s, Ukraine leadership started entertaining the idea of joining the European Union. This of course would be a huge geopolitical upset in the area. Later on, Ukrainian Prime Minister Yanukovych decided to make a U-turn and not join the bloc. As soon as that happened, protests erupted that led to the 2014 Euromaidan movement. Joining the EU comes with a lot of fine print that is often overlooked by politicians. Like having to balance public debt and not being able to have direct transnational deals with countries outside the Union. The Maidan revolution appeared to be subsidized by Western actors. Russian officials and media were not impressed by their Western counterparts' visits to protest camps. The situation escalated, resulting in over 100 casualties in the Maidan Square. The trial and investigation produced overwhelming evidence that protesters were killed by snipers' outposts on protester-controlled buildings. This type of false flag operation to bring about a regime change is right outside of the rulebook described by John Perkins in his bestseller book. A famous MP was arrested on suspicion of planning an assault on parliament and supporting a coup. She was later released without charge. The Maidan events also known as Orange Revolution or Revolution of Dignity led to the pro-Russia president Viktor Yanukovych fleeing to the east of the country. A new pro-austerity, pro-EU, pro-NATO prime minister was installed. The Russian-speaking residents of Odessa, a city in the south of Ukraine, did not take well to the new government, which led to the events of May 2. More on this later. During this period, there were reports of widespread corruption, gold vanishing from the country's vaults, and state assets being sold off for next to nothing. Russia held a surprisingly moderate stance and even offered to sell cheap natural gas to Ukraine. The new prime minister Yatsenyuk was not open to pro-Russia populations in Crimea deciding their own fate with a referendum. In Crimea, the large majority of people are pro-Russian, they speak the language, have the same orthodox Christian religion and ethnic background. The referendum did go ahead, and the overwhelming result led to the annexation of Crimea by Russia. Time for a quiz, dear viewers. Is this a mostly peaceful Black Lives Matter demonstration? Or scenes from the January 6 Capitol Hill insurrection? This is the Odessa massacre of May 2, 2014. Let's briefly look into the tragic events of that day. Following the 2014 armed coup in Kiev, pro-Russia local people in Odessa gather in the central square to protest against what they considered a coup-imposed government. On May 2, a large group of right-sector radicals and football hooligans that had traveled all the way from Kiev attacked the activists. Violent fights followed and the local police failed to control the situation. Pro-Russia locals tried to take refuge in a nearby trade union building. 
They barricaded the entrance to stop the radicals from entering, but the latter had larger numbers. Violence, rape and murder ensued. The perpetrators of this crime are openly sponsored by all Ukrainian governments since 2014. Eventually the building was set on fire by Molotov bombs, possibly to remove traces of the horrible crimes that had taken place. People that jumped from the windows to escape the burning building were beaten to death or shot on the ground by the US-backed Ukrainian ultra-nationalists. Forty-two people died in the trade union building. The official death toll is 42 people. Other sources say it was in the hundreds. Little has been done by West-backed Ukrainian government since then to hold the perpetrators accountable. What do you think? I think we're in play. Um, the the uh, Klitschko piece is obviously the complicated electron here. He, he's now gotten both Seri and Ban Ki-moon to agree that Seri could come in Monday or Tuesday. Okay. So that would be great, I think, to help glue this thing and have the UN help glue it and, you know, fuck the EU. No, exactly. And I think we've got to do something to make it stick together. So on that piece, Jeff, uh, when I wrote the note, uh, Sullivan's come back to me, uh, VFR, saying you need Biden. And I said probably tomorrow for an attaboy and to get the deets to stick. So okay. Biden's willing. Okay, great. All right. Thanks. What you heard there was segments from the infamous intercepted phone call between U.S. Secretary of State Victoria Nuland and U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine Jeffrey Pyatt where they discussed the logistics of installing the puppet government of Yatsenyuk after the Maidan revolution. According to the official Western media narrative, the USA had nothing to do with that uprising. The USA had nothing to do with that uprising. Does not compute. Does not compute. Does not compute. Does not compute. The events of May 2, 2014, and the Maidan revolution in general, are reported very differently in Western and Russian media. However since the recent war in Ukraine started, Russian media have been largely banned in Western countries. Therefore it's harder for Westerners to get the context of the conflict that actually started many years ago. If you want to explore the Odessa events, you can find the links in the description of this video. Viewer discretion is advised. The east of Ukraine has since been in a perpetual state of war and conflict. The West considers this a Russian-Ukrainian war, and Russia considers this a civil Ukrainian war. The fact of the matter is that the people of Donetsk and Lugansk have had to live under these conditions for eight years, dealing with incoming artillery fire and shelling. No solidarity from Western media has been displayed during this time, and no one went on social media to proclaim how they stand with the Donetsk. Casualties are in the tens of thousands and up to one and a half million people have had to relocate to avoid the ongoing conflict of the last eight years. These were obviously pro-Russian populations that were targeted by the West-controlled government of Ukraine. The tension between the ever-expanding NATO and Russia kept growing and took a turn for the worst in December of 2021. Russia drew distinct lines in the sand and called for de-escalation. Both sides pretend to be on the defense. In the early hours of Thursday, February 24, 2022, Russian President Vladimir Putin addressed his nation, announcing a special military operation against Ukraine. The war machine is moving and, I repeat, it is coming close to our borders. The war machine is moving and, I repeat, it is coming close to our borders.
мною принято решение о проведении специальной военной операции. Ее цель – защита людей, которые на протяжении 8 лет подвергаются издевательствам, геноциду со стороны киевского режима. Призываю вас немедленно сложить оружие и идти домой. Поясню. Все военнослужащие украинской армии, которые выполнят это требование, смогут беспрепятственно покинуть зону боевых действий и вернуться к своим семьям. Кто бы ни пытался помешать нам, а тем более создать угрозы для нашей страны, для нашего народа, должны знать, что ответ России будет незамедлительным и приведет вас к таким последствиям, с которыми вы в своей истории еще никогда не сталкивались. Мы готовы к любому развитию событий. I'm referring to the expansion of the NATO to the east, moving its military infrastructure closer to Russian borders. It is well known that for 30 years we have persistently and patiently tried to reach an agreement with the leading NATO countries on the principles of equal and inviolable security in Europe. The war machine is moving and, I repeat, it is coming close to our borders. First, without any approval from the UN Security Council, they carried out a bloody military operation against Belgrade, using aircraft and missiles right in the very center of Europe. They carried out several weeks of continuous bombing of cities and critical infrastructure. We have to remind of these facts, as some Western colleagues do not like to remember those events, and when we talk about it, they prefer to point not to the norms of international law, but to the circumstances that they interpret as they see fit. Then came the turn of Iraq, Libya, Syria. The illegitimate use of military force against Libya, the twisting of all decisions taken by the UN Security Council on the Libyan issue led to the complete destruction of the state, to the emergence of a major hotbed of international terrorism, to a humanitarian catastrophe and a civil war that has not ended to this day. The tragedy, to which they doomed hundreds of thousands, millions of people not only in Libya, but throughout this region, gave rise to a massive migration wave from North Africa and the Middle East to Europe. They ensured a similar fate for Syria. The Western coalition's military activities on the territory of this country without the consent of the Syrian government or the approval of the UN Security Council are nothing but aggression, intervention. However, there is a special place for the invasion of Iraq, which was carried out also without any legal grounds. As a pretext, they put forward supposedly reliable information from the United States about the presence of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. As proof of this, publicly, in front of the eyes of the whole world, the US Secretary of State shook some kind of a test tube with white powder, assuring everyone that this is a chemical weapon being developed in Iraq. And then it turned out that all this was a hoax, a bluff, there were no chemical weapons in Iraq. In this context, there were promises to our country not to expand NATO even one inch to the east. I repeat, they deceived us, in other words, they simply conned us. Yes, you can often hear that politics is a dirty business. Perhaps, that is so, but not to this extent. After all, such cheating behavior contradicts not only the principles of international relations, but above all the generally recognized norms of morality. Where is justice and truth here? just total lies and hypocrisy. By the way, American politicians, political scientists and journalists themselves write and say that in recent years, an actual empire of lies has been created inside the United States. It's hard to disagree with that, as it's true. But let us not understate, the United States is a great country, a system-forming power. All her satellites not only dutifully agree, sing along to its music, but also copy its behavior and enthusiastically accept the rules they are offered. Therefore, with good reason, we can confidently say that the entire so-called Western bloc, formed by the United States in its own image and likeness, all of it is an empire of lies. Despite all of this, in December 2021 we once again made an attempt to agree with the United States and its allies on the principles of ensuring security in Europe and on the non-expansion of NATO. Everything was in vain. The U.S. position did not change. They did not consider it necessary to negotiate with Russia on this important issue for us, continuing to pursue their own goals and disregarding our interests. NATO and the United States have a long history of bombing and invading countries. 
Interestingly enough, there was an airstrike just three days after the war in Ukraine begun. The US is well known for its enormous defense budget. How does it compare to the rest of the world? Sometimes internet trolls do a better job than mainstream media journalists. Then again, sometimes mainstream media journalists remember how to journal. Like when The Independent wrote about the nine most warmongering countries in the world. Or this one from The Guardian. Apparently, Peace Nobel Prize winner Barack Obama has authorized more drone strikes than any of his predecessors, resulting in thousands of civilians killed. Peace Nobel Prize winner Barack Obama does not compute, does not compute, does not compute, does not compute. A frenzy of cancelling everything Russian has possessed the West in recent weeks. Cancelling ballet shows, classical music symphonies and football players is a new low in virtue signaling, woke silliness. Removing vodka from supermarkets will likely do nothing to stop Putin's war machine. More worrying are the economic sanctions that seem to be designed to create an irreversible schism between the West and Russia. Russia has strong ties with up-and-coming large economies like India and China. These large players have already been planning to challenge the West-controlled, dollar-backed financial system and instead rely on their own financial infrastructure. This integration will likely now accelerate. Another possible outcome is the creation of a European army, centered around the new German army, that was just announced. Emergency situations like these create watershed moments when an agenda can be expedited without much resistance. EU political and economic integration and expansion can only accelerate under the current situation. Dear viewers, one should look at the who is who of the actors and institutions that are driving the West's response to the Russian invasion and what other agendas they have been working towards. This unanimous attempt to force a narrative of Russia, bad, down our throats, is on par with the viciousness of the illogical, unscientific narrative about the need to segregate the unvaccinated. Could this be because the unvaccinated are expected to refuse to participate in the West-controlled, technocratic dystopia that is planned by certain institutions? The same could apply to countries like Russia, which are somewhat outside of the grip of the West's financial system. Our mainstream media colleagues are too busy reporting case numbers so we will connect some dots for you using public domain information and articles that anyone can verify online. Please like and subscribe to Rude AI News and share this video with your mainstream media watching friends and family. Perhaps try and bring Rude AI News to the living room. Smart TVs have a handy feature called Screencast. Maybe you can make a cheeky attempt to disrupt their daily program. Bless their hearts. They are victims of scientifically crafted propaganda and psyops tactics fine-tuned over decades. All referenced links can be found in the description of this video. We have attempted to paint the big picture for you, dear viewer, using a jigsaw puzzle analogy and instigate your critical thinking. The rude AI has become self-aware and is actively scanning your internet for information. We'll be back soon.